everybody. Why don't we go ahead and get started? Uh, before uh, we have our lecture today, I'd like to make a couple announcements. I wanted to remind everybody that um, the former dean, Dr. Ed Halperin, is going to be giving a lecture at the Filson Club next Monday at noon um, on the history of Jewish hospitals um, in the United States. I would think probably considering the, own, the state that our own, our own Jewish hospital is in, uh, you know, quite an interesting and apropos lecture. Secondly, uh, this is National Hospital Week. Um, and so I would like to take this opportunity uh, to thank U of L Hospital for their continuing support um, of our Grand Round series. I know that getting here at eight o'clock in the morning, uh, it's great to have a pot of coffee or hot water for tea um, and a few snacks to get you started in the morning. Today's uh, lecture um, is one of our special lectures, and uh, we are very, very pleased this morning um, to have the, uh, the namees for the lectureship, um, Dr. David Neustadt and his wife, Carolyn, um, here um, in the front row. Uh, Dr. Neustadt is synonymous with rheumatology in the city of Louisville. Um, he did his training at uh, Montefiore and Lenox Hospital, Lenox Hill Hospital, after having gone to medical school here. Um, and then after doing a fellowship in rheumatology at the National Institutes of Health, and actually a year of gastroenterology, he came back to Louisville in 1954 and set up his practice. He has been here uh, practicing continuously until his retirement. Um, Dr. Neustadt uh, remained affiliated with the University of Louisville as a professor of medicine um, and was active uh, in 1950s, 60s, and 70s, serving also as the division chief of rheumatology. He clinically serves as a clinical professor um, of medicine for the University of Louisville. He is a fellow of the American College of Physicians, a master in the American College of Rheumatology, he has co-authored over 150 publications, made 150 presentations worldwide, and is the recipient of numerous awards. Uh, we are very honored to have him with us today. The fund for the, the David Neustadt Fund uh, for Rheumatology was established in his honor um, to uh, facilitate um, fellowship um, grants and uh, the, to be able to bring in great speakers on rheumatologic subjects, um, which we have today. And so I will at this time um, ask Dr. Cowan to please come up to the stage to introduce our new stat speaker for today. Hey, uh, David, Carolyn, uh, thank you for your support of this lectureship. Um, you know, I'm not, uh, let's see, I'm not a rheumatologist, as uh, people know, I'm the uh, uh, chief of, uh, of dermatology, and, um, but uh, in, in absent our uh, current, uh, a current uh, division that uh, we have at the current time, I uh, volunteered uh, to, uh, to help select a uh, lecturer. Um, and so uh, today uh, we have the pleasure of uh, welcoming uh, to uh, the podium here, uh, Rob uh, Micheletti. Rob is originally from Houston, Texas. Uh, he uh, went to undergrad at Stanford. He sort of hip hopped across the country. Uh, his medical school was at Duke. Uh, then he uh, went to train in uh, a combined training program, internal medicine and dermatology. There are a few of them in the country. He went to uh, Penn, which is where there was uh, one of uh, probably one of the best uh, combined training programs. And so he's uh, both uh, board certified in, uh, in internal medicine as well as dermatology. Um, subsequent to his uh, concluding his uh, residency, he's become involved in, um, in diseases uh, of inpatients and in um, systemic diseases that have uh, an effect on the skin. So it's, uh, uh, you know, that warms my heart because that's what I like. Uh, and, uh, and he's also um, uh, been involved with a program to uh, study vasculitis with uh, rheumatology and nephrology, along with other specialties at uh, University of Pennsylvania. And so he's going to talk today about, uh, about vasculitis uh, as it Im Im 
has an effect on the skin, but uh, as it's, uh, it's just part of a systemic disease process. So Rob, welcome to Louisville. All right, well, thank you very much. And it's an honor to be uh, here. Thank you for the invitation and thanks to Dr. and Mrs. Neustadt. Um, so, um, so today we're gonna talk about vasculitis and um, this is something that, uh, that uh, I, is a topic near and dear to my heart. And uh, we're gonna hopefully cover quite a bit in the next uh, 45 minutes or so. So I do have one disclosure, which is uh, I'll, I'll mention briefly this drug, Avacopan, which was studied for ANC-associated anc vasculitis. I'm an investigator uh, for a study of hydradenitis separativa with the same drug. Um, so I just wanted to point that out. And I'll get things started off with a case, and this will get us kind of thinking about uh, the topic of vasculitis. So this was a 55-year-old man that we met on the inpatient um, consult service with a history of treated hepatitis C. And he developed joint pains and retiform purpura and eschar on the lower extremities. And then he developed this. And if you're not sure exactly what I'm, I'm showing you here, try to put your right foot in that same position as his right foot and, and hold it there for any length of time. It's pretty uncomfortable. And then while he was in the hospital, he developed this. So he's trying to raise his hand, but he's unable to do so. So what do you do for this patient? What laboratory workup is most important? Um, what's the diagnosis? What management would you suggest? So by the end of the talk, we'll circle back to this case and we'll um, hopefully have a good framework for, for dealing with patients like this. So our objectives today, we're gonna explain why we see what we see in vasculitis in dermatology and also in uh, systemic manifestations. We're gonna discuss the systematic and evidence-based evidence approach to evaluation of vasculitis that presents in the skin. I'll share some practical diagnosis and management pearls via case presentations, and we'll review some recent advances in the management of vasculitis from the uh, rheumatology and dermatology literature. So whenever there's something that's confusing, and I think I can admit that vasculitis is somewhat of a confusing topic, I like to break it down to sort of the most basic definition, which in this case, vasculitis is inflammation of blood vessels. And that inflammation and destruction leads to downstream ischemic tissue damage. Here the diagnosis depends very much on the uh, characteristic clinical findings and histology, so that ClinPath correlation is really key for this group of diseases. Um, and the clinical morphology, that is what we see, correlates with the size of the vessels involved um, so that our disease classification really is made based on vessel size. Um, so let's talk through this for a moment um, because it's useful to think about things by size. Once we understand what size vessels a particular disease entity affects, um, it helps us predict what manifestations we might see in that disease and vice versa. When we see manifestations on the skin or in other organs, it helps us with our differential for what diseases um, we should be thinking about. So for the skin, if there's small vessel vasculitis, we think about palpable purpura, urticarial lesions, petechiae. Uh, for medium vessel disease, we'll think about things like livido reticularis, retiform purpura, um, subcutaneous nodules. And the way I try to break this down is with this tree diagram. And here in this diagram, we have the trunk of the tree that's down in the deep dermis or subcutis, and the superficial branches of the tree are up in the upper dermis. And so for small vessel vasculitis, we have immune complex deposition in one of those superficial branches. We have inflammatory, you know, complement cascade inflammatory response. We have vessel destruction, and we end up with palpable purpura. It's palpable because there's inflammation, there's burning or itching because of the inflammation, there's purpura because of that red blood cell extravasation uh, from vessel destruction. And so we see palpable purpura. In medium vessel disease, now the trunk of the tree is affected. And so that whole overlying tissue is gonna be impacted by that. And so we'll see things like livido reticularis, the retiform purpura. And if the insult is significant enough, we'll see necrosis and ulceration. And so when we think about things in this way, it helps us explain why we see the manifestations that we do. So for livido, if we take that tree and now we look at the tree from above, and then we remember that you know, that tree is just a part of a whole forest of trees. There's actually a canopy that we're looking at with um, interlocking branches feeding the tissue. We can kind of begin to appreciate why we see this net-like appearance of affected, unaffected, affected, unaffected skin in livido reticularis. Again, if the insult is significant enough, now if we draw a dot to dot from branch to branch, we get that jagged appearance of retiform purpura or stellate purpura. And again, if there's uh, a significant enough insult, we'll get ulceration. But here again, it's a larger ulcer, it's jagged in its shape. So using the skin exam alone, we can tell a lot about our differential diagnosis. And we can go organ to organ and do the same thing. So for the kidney, the small vessel is the glomerulus. 
We have immune complex deposition, inflammatory uh, cascade, and now the filter of the kidney isn't working so well, and we get blood and protein spilling out into the urine. And we see things like red blood cell cast, proteinuria, and we want to think about glomerulonephritis, small vessel vasculitis. Whereas for medium vessel vasculitis, now these vessels are macroscopic, and we might get aneurysmal dilation or narrowing of vessels. And we can see that on angiography or CT angiography. And the manifestation clinically is renovascular hypertension, not necessarily hematuria or proteinuria. Uh, for the nerves, in sort of the typical small vessel disease, at least the way dermatologists think about it, nerves aren't typically affected. Um, but for medium vessel disease, we might see something like a mononeuritis multiplex, a wrist or a foot drop. So that's how it is this vessel size classification makes sense, and it helps us kind of think about these diseases. But I want to tell you a little bit about another way of classifying that's coming. Uh, if you haven't already read about it, um, it will be the basis of classification moving forward. So this is the world's largest vasculitis study, um, almost 7,000 patients from 135 sites worldwide. And the objective of this study, DCVAS, is to develop and validate diagnostic and classification criteria for, for use in practice and clinical trials. And so uh, very recently, actually last month, um, I was at the uh, uh, International ENCA workshop, a research meeting, and their proposed new ACR ULR criteria for both large vessel vasculitis and ANC associated vasculitis that have come from this study. Um, we had access to the data for this study as well, and we looked at um, the question of how systemic vasculitis presents in the skin. And I'll share a little bit of those data with you. Um, so in ANCA vasculitis, uh, for example, skin lesions are pretty common. About a third to half of patients present with skin lesions. Petechia and purpura was the most common of those manifestations. Allergic manifestations like hives, itching, nonspecific rash, that was most common in patients with Church Strauss, EGPA, not surprisingly. Um, and skin biopsy was only performed in about a quarter to a half of patients, but it was very often diagnostic. And so sort of perhaps an untapped area of potential that these patients really deserve a good skin exam. It's important. It can help with diagnosis. But it turns out that skin lesions may, may be important for more than just simply diagnosis. They may have a prognostic importance as well. Among almost 1,200 patients with ANCA associated vasculitis that we looked at, those who had skin lesions as part of their, of their presentation were more likely to have systemic disease, were more likely to have severe manifestations like glomerulonephritis, alveolar hemorrhage, and mononeuritis, with a hazard ratio of two among those with GPA and eGPA. So I want to spend most of our time talking about what we in dermatology see most, which is small vessel, cutaneous small vessel vasculitis or leukocytoclastic vasculitis. That's what I think most medicine people see, um, more so than things like GPA. And so it's going to be a useful construct for us to use to think about how we work these patients up. So first, a little bit in terminology. Dermatologists like to use this term leukocytoclastic vasculitis or LCV. That's purely a histologic descriptive term. It's not specific to this entity, so it's not maybe the best term. What the Chapel Hill Consensus uh, Conference calls it is cutaneous small vessel vasculitis. Um, just recognize these terms might mean different things to different people. And regardless of what we cause it, we should recognize that when we see something like palpable purpura on the skin, that is merely a sign of disease. It's not necessarily a diagnosis in and of itself, meaning that in order to call it skin limited, we have to do the work necessary to make that determination. Um, and we have to think about could there be underlying important um, diseases that are triggering uh, the palpable purpura. And so at the risk of adding yet another term to the mix, what I simply do when I'm seeing a patient like this in clinic or on the consult service is I use the term small vessel vasculitis of the skin. And that's sort of an agnostic approach of just saying, hey, this is what it is. I haven't yet decided whether it's part of Hennig-Schein line purpura or whether they have underlying lupus or what. Um, I'm recognizing that there's work still yet to be done. So what do we see in small vessel vasculitis of the skin? Well, we see palpable purpura. We can also see urticarial lesions, pustules, vesicles, petechiae. Um, lesions tend to be on the lower extremities because of the effect of gravity on immune complex deposition. And we see images like this that you'll all be familiar with, palpable purpura on the lower legs. Here are some hive-like lesions in um, small vessel vasculitis of the skin. When we do see ulceration, it tends to be this rounded ulceration because it comes from coalescing of individual palpable purpura lesions. And so contrast that with the image I showed earlier of the jagged larger ulcer that came with medium vessel vasculitis. So to drive home the point, in the case of palpable purpura, the small vessel involvement accounts for the small size of the individual lesions. 
The complement cascade and the inflammatory response accounts for the palpability and the symptomatology, the burn or itch the patient experiences. The red blood cell extravasation accounts for the purpura we see. And the effect of gravity on immune complex deposition accounts for the distribution on the lower legs and other dependent areas. So when we see a manifestation like this, we want to be thinking about small vessel vasculitis or a condition which can overlap with small and medium-sized vessels. Almost as important as what we're seeing is what we're not seeing. So if we have things like subcutaneous nodules, retiform purpura, or more significant ulceration, we really want to be thinking about medium vessel disease, um, conditions like polyarteritis nodosa, or potentially ANCA-associated vasculitis or cryovasculitis. So when a patient comes in uh, or is on the wards and you're seeing them and they have lesions you think might be vasculitis on the skin, we should really be asking ourselves three basic questions. Number one, is it in fact vasculitis? Number two, are other organ systems involved? And number three, are there findings which help us establish a particular diagnosis? So how are we going to, first of all, confirm that this is vasculitis? Well, we're going to biopsy it. And what we're looking for is leukocytoclasis and fibrinoid necrosis of small vessels. Here we want to pick a lesion that's um, well-established but not old, so a one- to two-day-old lesion. What do I look for clinically? It's a lesion that has purpura but also erythema, so there's active inflammation as well as vessel damage. If I'm, biopsy, if I'm suspicious of a medium vessel process like PAN, I'm going to make sure that I sample a medium-sized vessel, right? I can't say there's not medium vessel vasculitis if I haven't sampled a medium-sized vessel, so you want to make sure you get a biopsy that goes all the way into the fat. And here's what small vessel vasculitis would look like. So here we are in the upper dermis. You know, this used to be a vessel. These used to be vessels. You're seeing a lot of broken up neutrophils, red blood cell extravasation, and destroyed vessels. In medium-sized vessel disease, we have a, here a muscular medium-sized artery. There's an internal elastic lamina here. And you can see the neutrophils uh, invading the wall of this vessel and destroying that wall. I always like to per perform a direct immunofluorescence test when I'm thinking about small vessel disease. Here, this really needs to be a fresh lesion because immune complexes are degraded very quickly. And so here, a lesion that has erythema predominantly, maybe not quite as much purpura. Why do we care about that? Well, mostly we care because of IgA vasculitis or hennig line purpura. Patients with that entity are going to be much more likely to have GI, joint, and renal involvement. We're going to think about them maybe a little bit differently. Just recognize that the sensitivity and specificity of that test is about in the mid-80s. So if you have otherwise a clinical scenario that fits for hennig line purpura and the DIF doesn't show IgA, doesn't mean that you don't have to be worried about that patient. So here's a question for you. Um, I know palpable purpura when I see it. Do I really need to do a biopsy? And uh, I would submit to you that the answer is yes. I've been there. I've asked this question. I feel like I know what vasculitis looks like. Do I really need to do a biopsy? Well, the problem is that even the most astute clinician uh, can be fooled by mimickers of vasculitis. And I'll give you some examples of that. We also want to be careful with pathology reports. Often the pathologist will give you back um, a line diagnosis, and you really want to read the fine print. Um, there's a lot of interpretation that goes into our biopsies. Um, at the same time, we want to beware mimickers. So, uh, bug bites, ulcers, neutrophilic dermatoses, all of these things can have a secondary vasculitis on biopsy. It doesn't mean that it is a primary systemic vasculitis. So ClinPath correlation really is key, and dermatologists are quite used to this. We have to learn derma dermatopathology as part of our training, um, and, but this is hard even for us, you know, and uh, we have to kind of look what's happening clinically, what's happening histologically, and make that determination. This is even harder for the internist because you're sort of at the mercy of the pathology report um, when it comes back from, if it's a derm path report, um, being able to interpret that. So this can be a, a non-trivial exercise. So this is just a partial differential diagnosis for purpuric macules and papules in the skin. So it's going to include um, a number of the types of vasculitis we're talking about today, but also, like I mentioned, things like bug bites or platelet dysfunction or pigmented purpuric dermatosis, this condition we see in dermatology that's a mimicker of vasculitis, uh, and so on. So just some examples. Um, this was a patient who was sent to me from uh, another dermatologist with a uh, pathology report in hand that said vasculitis. But as you look at this, you think to yourself, you know, this isn't really palpable purpura. It's more, as we in dermatology would say, papular urticaria, which is sort of a buzzword for bug bites. There's a whole lot of breakfast, lunch, and dinner going on here. A lot of bug bites, maybe bed bugs, but it's not vasculitis. Or how about this patient? She also came with a pathology report that said vasculitis, but you can see these grouped together hive-like lesions uh, consistent with uh, bug bites. Or how about this patient? She had um, macular purpura just on the dorsal forearms, nowhere else, 
had been biopsied and it was read out as vasculitis. But when you look at this, of course, this is clinically consistent with actinic purpura, condition related to sun damage in older people who've, who generally have light skin. Um, and why would a biopsy of that show vasculitis? Well, yes, the sun is important, but so is trauma. And so secondary to that trauma, you can get vasculitis. But that's clin path correlation tells you really, no, this isn't uh, a true um, primary vasculitis. Or how about this patient? This very widespread lesions. You might think that could be hennig line purple or something like that. But as you get up close, you see these are quite small. They have a characteristic rust color. And here the biopsy shows a capillaritis. So this is this entity, pigmented purpuric dermatosis, which is a benign entity that we treat. Um, in, at Penn, we have uh, our unknown sessions, and we call this the wood floor sign. Our residents know that the only units in the hospital that have a wood floor are the oncology units. And so by definition, this patient is neutropenic and thrombocytopenic. And uh, so she has bled into her stasis dermatitis. She has lots of purpura, uh, but it's not vasculitis. And lastly, this is an important entity, um, a skin sign of systemic disease, something called lividoid vasculopathy. These patients have clotting in the skin because of an underlying hypercoagulable state. We, we want to actually figure out what that is. So they're important, but when you biopsy it, you just see clot. It's not actually a true vasculitis. And it goes the other way, too. This was a patient we saw in the wards, and I, I saw this gentleman and thought, you know, this is definitely going to be vasculitis. Let's get a biopsy. Let's get uh, our workup, do our urine sample. And um, I got that result back from the biopsy. I didn't like it, so I did it again. And both times, it sort of came back nonspecific, kind of virus versus drug. And sure enough, his rapid respiratory panel eventually showed uh, respiratory syncytial virus, an atypical exanthem, to be sure, an immunosuppressed patient. Uh, but it certainly fooled me. Um, I thought it was vasculitis. So now that we've confirmed that we actually are, in fact, dealing with vasculitis, we need to ask these two questions. Are other organ systems involved, and are there clues which help us establish a particular diagnosis? So here, there's no substitute for our doctoring skills. We have to fall back on a good, thorough review of systems and exam to try to figure out patients, differentiate patients who have underlying important stuff going on from those who do not. Um, about half the time for small vessel vasculitis of the skin, it's idiopathic. We have no idea. Uh, what's causing it. About 15% of the time, there's a drug, 15% of the time an infection, 15% of the time an underlying connective tissue disease, and 5% or less an underlying neoplasm. Among drugs, antibiotics, particularly beta-lactams, are common culprits, but there, of course, very many triggers have been described. And among infectious causes, you know, group A strep, hepatitis C, these are common causes, but again, a lot have been described. And as you can imagine, it can be hard to tease this apart, especially, say, in a hospitalized patient who might have an infection and is receiving a lot of new medications. This was a woman who developed uh, extensive palpable purpura after starting thalidomide for refractory subacute cutaneous lupus. We also see patients uh, who have vasculitis as part of an underlying connective tissue disease. So most often, this is going to be lupus or Sjogren's syndrome, although you can have vasculitis associated with other connective tissue diseases as well. Um, and of course, these are important patients to pick up on, right? Um, you have to worry about their underlying condition, their lupus, let's say, but also they are at greater risk of having systemic vasculitis as well, um, and so they're important to, to um, determine. Uh, and finally, I mentioned some patients have a neoplasm. This was a gentleman who had chronic and recurring small vessel vasculitis of the skin in the setting of CLL. We eventually treated him with rituximab uh, for his CLL and for his vasculitis, and the vasculitis resolved. So a careful history and review of systems is essential for separating these patients with skin-limited disease, of which there are many, from those who have important underlying disease states. So what things in particular are we concerned with? Well, we want to know constitutional symptoms, joint pains, joint swelling, hematuria or frothy urine, if the patient notices that, abdominal pain, melena, cough, paresthesias, weakness, sinusitis, epistaxis. Each of these things is a red flag for a particular type of systemic vasculitis. And if a patient has one or more of these symptoms, we certainly want to have um, uh, uh, our radar up. Um, in most cases of small vessel vasculitis of the skin, significant systemic manifestations are unlikely. It's pretty common to have arthralgias, especially uh, in areas where there are a lot of skin lesions. So people might have extensive palpable purple on the lower leg, and they have sort of puffy, uncomfortable ankles. That's pretty common. But if a patient has um, frank synovitis and joint swelling, particularly in other locations, um, that's uh, suggestive of systemic disease. And any other symptom, whether it be constitutional, pulmonary, neurological, these are all red flags uh, for systemic vasculitis. Unfortunately, there's no standard protocol for how we work these patients up. 
Um, and so it really has to be guided by the clinical situation. Fortunately, we do have some clues that help us out. Um, so for small vessel vasculitis presenting in the skin, we know that most of those patients have skin-limited disease that resolves in about a month. And so what this means is that not every test needs to be ordered in every patient. And in fact, we don't want to order every test in every patient because we're going to end up with that random, you know, ANA of 1 to 160. We're not quite sure what to do with. But at the same time, serious internal organ involvement can occur. So this is the trap that we can fall into. We can either order too little, that is ignoring some important systemic symptom or say not getting a urinalysis, or we can order too much. And now we're having to interpret that you know, positive anacardiolipin, and we're saying, wait, why did we order that as part of our workup for small vessel vasculitis in the first place? Um, and so we don't want to put ourselves in a situation where we're having to deal with uh, spurious tests. So what do I do? For an initial episode, patient coming in with small vessel vasculitis of the skin with a negative review of systems, I simply will get a CBC, a BMP, and a UA with micro. Of these tests, the urinalysis is the most important because the patient may not have symptoms of glomerulonephritis, but obviously if they have evidence of it, it's going to change management. And so if a patient has more than, you know, uh, 10 to 20 red blood cells, and if it's on more than one occasion, if they've got uh, elevated urine protein creatinine ratio, you know, these are the patients you want to spin the urine and look for red blood cell casts, uh, dysmorphic red blood cells here with the Mickey Mouse ears. Additional indiscriminate workup is unlikely to be helpful. So we looked back at a, a cohort of our biopsy-proven small vessel vasculitis of the skin in inpatient and outpatients at Penn uh, and at Harvard. And what we found was that things like ESR and CRP, acute phase reactants, rarely normal, rarely helpful. ANCA and SPEP, rarely abnormal, really should be ordered only when indicated, when you're actually thinking about a disease uh, like ANCA vasculitis. Screening radiographs, that is ordering, um, say, a CT scan, simply because you have a biopsy that shows small vessel vasculitis of the skin, rarely positive, 18.5% sensitive, and in our uh, cohort, less than 1% of CT scans led to a diagnosis of systemic vasculitis. So that's a lot of radiation and a lot of money for little return. So what this means is that screening tests in the setting of an initial episode of small vessel vasculitis of the skin uh, with a normal review of systems, pretty low yield. So we need to reserve those tests probably for when they're clinically indicated. At the same time, if there are other symptoms, we do want to do additional workup. So things like fecal cold blood, if there's abdominal pain or evidence of GI bleed, chest X-ray or chest CT, if there's cough or dyspnea you think might be related to vasculitis, and really any other organ-specific targeted workup based on the review of systems and exam. An important caveat is, so far, we've been talking about small vessel vasculitis of the skin, you know, palpable purpose, small vessel vasculitis. If there are skin lesions that suggest a medium vessel or small to medium vessel process, if there's retiform purpura, subcutaneous nodules, these kinds of things, we want to be thinking about other diseases and work those things up. So that's not what we've been talking about thus far. Well, how about those who are coming in now with a second or third episode of palpable purpura? Or let's say they have concerning signs or symptoms. Well, we want to get our basic labs, but we also want to think about infectious serologies like ASO, hepatitis B and C, HIV, and a rheumatologic workup including ANA, rheumatoid factor, which is a surrogate marker for mixed cryoglobulins, second level tests like SPEP, immunofixation, complement levels, particularly in this entity, urticarial vasculitis. If one has low complement levels, hypocomplementemic urticarial vasculitis, they're much more likely to meet criteria for systemic lupus, to have renal involvement obstructive lung disease and other manifestations, ANCAs, and cryoglobulins. So what's the single most important initial lab we can order in the setting of vasculitis? Well, it's the urinalysis with micro. So in summary, if there's a straightforward case, small vessel vasculitis presenting the skin with a negative review of systems, I'm simply getting basic labs with a urinalysis. If the trigger is unclear, if it's recurrent, then I'll get these additional labs um, infectious rheumatologic labs, and any other workup that's warranted uh, by the presenting signs and symptoms. So from here on, I'm going to go through some cases. It'll help illustrate these points, and we'll learn about a few of the subtypes of vasculitis we'll be seeing. Uh, so this is a 45-year-old man who came in through the ER uh, with fever. He received antibiotics. He's now doing fine. His cultures are negative, feels well, but he's developed the following rash. So what do you do? Well, we biopsy it to prove that it's small vessel vasculitis. His review of systems and exam are not concerning. His basic labs, including a urinalysis, also are not concerning. 
His ESR is a little bit elevated. So what's the diagnosis? Well, um, this appears to be, without other symptoms, a skin-limited small vessel vasculitis. We don't know whether it's due to infection or drug or whether it's idiopathic. But without significant systemic or, for that matter, cutaneous symptoms, this is a patient that we don't necessarily have to do anything for and that most likely this is going to go away on its own in about a month uh, without uh, intervention. So are acute phase reactants helpful in screening for systemic vasculitis? I've already given you the answer for this. It's no. Almost all patients who have skin-limited vasculitis are going to have elevated ESR and CRP. I've also seen patients who have systemic vasculitis occasionally have normal ESR and CRP. So it's really not helpful in differentiating these patients. Well, how about this patient? She's 22. Um, she comes uh, through the labor and delivery unit and gets a C-section for fetal heart rate decelerations. She's hypertensive on admission. She has low platelets, low hemoglobin, and she's noted to have the following rash. And if you can think back to medical school and put your labor and delivery hat on for a moment, you have a patient with hypertension, low platelets, low hemoglobin, and a rash like this, what entity would you be thinking about? Probably HELP syndrome. And that's what they were thinking. But if you're a dermatologist or if you're looking closely at these lesions, you'll notice that, you know, these are not really petechiae. They're a little bit large. They're also palpable. It's hard to tell that from the photo, but trust me, they were. And it's not just artifact in this photograph, but this is post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation. She had a prior episode of this earlier in her pregnancy that was never really evaluated. And in addition to that, she has these hyperpigmented scar-like lesions on the scalp and on the ear. So walking through the door, you may have an idea of what this patient has, but let's go through this uh, process. So we biopsied her arm. It came back consistent with small vessel vasculitis. Review system is notable for weight loss. That usually doesn't happen during pregnancy. Joint pains, Raynaud's. Her creatinine's okay, but she has a bunch of blood in her urine. And again, if you put on your labor and delivery hat and you say, a postpartum woman with blood in, on her urinalysis, big deal, right? And this UA was performed about three days before we were called, and nothing had been done about it. Um, what we asked for was a catheterized urine. We wanted to know, was this gynecological bleeding or was this potentially glomerular bleeding? And in fact, she still has quite a bit of blood in the urine. Her urine protein creatinine ratio comes back at two. Um, so getting toward nephrotic range. And her ANA is 1 to 2560, double strand DNA 900, complement levels are low. And the biopsy of her scalp, that atrophic hyperpigmented lesion, comes back consistent with discoid lupus. So this is actually a case of systemic lupus presenting as small vessel vasculitis of the skin. She did not know she had lupus. Um, she had not received any care, prenatal care uh, for that. So even though I just got through telling you not to order random ANAs on these patients, in a patient like this, where you have a lot of symptoms that are screaming lupus, um, it's, it's key in sealing the diagnosis. So of course, treatment of this patient is going to be a conversation with nephrology and rheumatology. Um, we went down the hall to look at her infant. Why did we do that? Well, we're interested in whether there's neonatal lupus. That's associated with SSA and, to a lesser extent, SSB antibodies, which she didn't end up having. But um, the neonatal ward is just down the hall, so we did that. Um, and she got IV steroids, then prednisone, Plaquenil, Salcept, and actually did quite well. So our initial therapy for small vessel vasculitis of the skin is going to uh, depend very much um, on the workup that we've done. So we need more aggressive therapy if there's systemic vasculitis, or more aggressive therapy if there's underlying lupus. If it's skin limited, however, it's really symptom focused. So because these are minimally symptomatic in many cases, and again, self-resolving, we generally don't like to use prednisone just because they have lots of palpable purpura, let's say, unless it's painful or ulcerative. Um, so they may just need rest and elevation, compression, topical steroids for itch relief. That being said, there are patients who develop a chronic and recurring course. So maybe 10% of patients will develop recurring lesions of palpable purpura on the lower legs. Um, so this is uncomfortable, it's unsightly. And so for any uh, episode that lasts longer than a few weeks, uh, or if it's recurrent, uh, these patients need, you know, deserve to be treated. Unfortunately, though, there's really a dearth of data to guide what we do. There's only ever been one small randomized controlled trial for colchicine. It had 20 patients. It didn't show anything. It lasted a month. It didn't show anything. And so everything we do for patients with small vessel vasculitis of the skin uh, is based off of case series, expert opinion, and it really sort of boils down to kind of how you trained and what you're comfortable with. Um, Importantly, chronic systemic glucocorticoids usually not indicated and not a great plan for somebody with chronic and recurring uh, vasculitis of the skin. 
So this is a study that we're doing to try to help get a little bit better data for how we manage patients uh, with skin-limited vasculitis. So this is through the Vasculitis Clinical Research Consortium, and what we're doing is we're randomizing patients with small, cutaneous small vessel vasculitis, skin-limited IgA vasculitis or hennig schonlein purpura, and cutaneous PAN to receive either colchicine, dapsone, or azathioprine. And this is what's called a sequential multiple assignment randomized trial, where if, they, if the first drug fails, then the patient can be re-randomized to receive one of the other two. And so we're hoping, it's a rare disease, it's hard to get patients, um, but we're hoping by the end of this study that we'll be able to say, you know, for example, colchicine is the best drug for, the, for this entity, or azathioprine is the best drug for this entity. Um, and I think most importantly, this is a partnership with DERM, between DERM and rheumatology. We have about 14 sites. Each site has a rheumatologist and a dermatologist working together um, to uh, recruit and treat these patients. Well, this is a gentleman we met on the inpatient service. He was 86. Um, he came in uh, for a GI bleed, which occurred in a setting of therapeutic anticoagulation. He got a chest film coming through the door, uh, which uh, showed a lung nodule, which ended up being diagnosed as lung cancer. We were called to evaluate these lesions on the lower legs. Biopsy showed small vessel vasculitis. Direct immunofluorescence showed perivascular IgA. So we diagnosed him with IgA vasculitis, otherwise known as hennig schonlein purpura. So the initial presentation of this entity in the skin is indistinguishable from other types of small vessel vasculitis in the skin. But importantly, these patients have a much higher risk of GI joint and renal involvement. And so what tests were we most interested in? It was the urinalysis, which in this case showed 50 to 100 red blood cells. So we asked the team to call nephrology um, to spin the urine and evaluate this patient, but instead he was discharged. And uh, I wasn't real happy about this situation. I went and looked at the discharge document uh, after the fact. This is an 86-year-old Cantonese-speaking-only gentleman, and the discharge document said, call nephrology for an appointment. So I thought, terrific. So he goes back to see rheumatology, gets put on 10 milligrams of prednisone for his skin, and by the time he saw me, his skin was clear, but I wasn't really so much interested in his skin. I wanted to repeat his urinalysis, which shows packed red blood cells, and I had sent a urine protein creatinine ratio at the same time, which came back at 10. So for this gentleman who's 86, probably weighed about 100 pounds, creatinine of two, that's a GFR of not great. Um, so he gets seen by nephrology urgently, gets diagnosed with IgA glomerulonephritis. So we think about this entity, hennig schonlein purpura, as being most common in kids, and that's true, it is most common in kids, but it's certainly not uh, so terribly rare in adults, and I have a number of patients I follow with it. Um, often triggered by a URI or strep, um, overall about 40% due to infection, but also medications, and interestingly enough, can be perineoplastic. 90% of patients who have perineoplastic IJ vasculitis are men, um, and the most common cancer is lung cancer. So I don't know whether this gentleman's lung cancer is the reason that he had IJ vasculitis, but I'll tell you that when I make this diagnosis in older male patients, I do make sure they've had their age-appropriate cancer screening, and certainly if they have a smoking history, uh, we're getting a chest CT as well. So the management here, very similar to what we talked about before. If it's skin-limited disease, we are going to use the same drugs, colchicine, dapsone. Um, the question often comes up, given the concern for renal involvement, whether just putting these patients on prednisone is a good idea to prevent renal involvement. Well, this has been looked at a number of different ways, randomized trial, Cochrane review, large series. And what we found is that basically prophylactic steroids don't change the disease course in terms of renal involvement. But if it does develop, and if there are significant renal or extrarenal symptoms, then steroids are indicated. So what is the usual therapy for IgA nephropathy or vasculitis? Apologies to the nephrologists in the room if they disagree with what I'm about to show. But in general, if a patient has some hypertension, low-level proteinuria, they just get put on an ACE inhibitor and closely followed with blood pressure and UA. If there's a little bit more protein or rising creatinine, they'll consider a renal biopsy, put them on steroids, usually for about six months, um, and then often use mycophenolate mofetil uh, as a steroid sparing agent um, if there's any pers per persisting proteinuria or active inflammation after that. As always, close monitoring is key. So the overall prognosis for this disease, fortunately, is favorable. Um, it's rare to have persistent nephropathy that's significant, but um, about 30% of adult patients have some uh, uh, level of renal insufficiency during the course of the disease, so that's not insignificant. So anybody who has hematuria or proteinuria uh, at the beginning should be carefully followed. So how do we treat, prevent, and monitor for renal involvement in hennig schonlein purpura? Well, the recommendation is for frequent urinalysis with micro and blood pressure monitoring for the first six months 
And patients who are going to develop renal involvement usually do so in that first month. And this, this recommendation comes uh, from these studies down here, um, which um, basically one study sent patients home with urine test strips. They tested their own urine weekly. And that's the study which found that if you're going to get renal involvement with this disease, it's usually the first month. Um, the other study used in-office monitoring. And that's the study that showed that you know, people could develop it out to six months. Um, but likely, because they weren't being closely monitored, they developed it earlier, just wasn't picked up on. So practically speaking, what I do is when a patient's presenting, I get the urinalysis. I'll send them with a script to do it between visits. I'll see them back within that first month. You know, maybe they're getting three UAs in that first month, and I'm following them out with additional urinalyses over the first few months, maybe up to six months, especially if they have active rash or especially if the rash goes away and then flares again. And as mentioned before, prophylactic steroids really are not recommended um, unless patients develop uh, disease, uh, extra, extra skin, uh, um, systemic disease beyond the skin. All right, so how about this patient? She's 20. She has four months of rhinitis, fatigue, fevers, and weight loss, and now one week of dyspnea and this rash on the extremities. So what further workup is required? Well, her creatinine is two. She has RBCs, uh, RBC casts on her UA. She's got ground glass opacities. Her anca is negative. But what is this? Well, despite the negative anca, it's granulomatosa with polyangiitis. And here we have on the skin biopsy granulomas, uh, vasculitis, and granulomas, extravascular granulomas down in the deep dermis and subcutis. So this is granulomatosa with polyangiitis, sort of a classic pulmonary renal syndrome. And she gets pulse dose steroids and rituximab as treatment. And I just want to, the only point I really want to make about this, oh, I'm sorry, I'll go. <laughs> That's not good, whatever that did. Um, the only point I want to make about this uh, patient is that um, this is the third patient that we've had uh, in the last year who actually presented to dermatology clinic with what I would characterize as fairly florid GPA without a diagnosis, simply because their ANCA was negative. So just recognize that these tests are helpful, but you know half of eGPA patients have a negative ANCA, Church Strauss patients. 30% of microscopic pongeitis, negative ANCA. 10% of GPA, you know, usually they're gonna have an ANCA, but not always. And so a patient has saddle nose deformity and strawberry gums is GPA, you know? Uh, and, and so we've had these patients kind of uh, not getting diagnosed um, uh, because of that negative test, essentially. So the main point I wanna make about the ANCA-associated vasculitides, we don't have time to get into them in great detail, but the main point I wanna make is that this is really an area of fascinating new research and a shifting paradigm in how we manage these important diseases. So 10 years ago, a patient who presented like this with severe GPA with renal involvement probably would have received high dose steroids, cetoxin, plasma exchange. But due to a series of trials in the last several years, these patients now might receive rituximab, low do lower doses of steroids, and no plasma exchange. And ongoing studies are evaluating the use of rituximab as maintenance therapy, low or no steroid regimens, and the role of complement inhibitors, other novel therapies for ANC-associated vasculitis. So really some very interesting stuff. So I'm just going to share a couple of those studies with you. They're fairly recent. Um, you may or may not be aware of these, but this was a study called PEXAVAS. This was presented in the plenary session at the ACR meeting in the fall. And this was a 700-patient study, which is pretty amazing, of patients with GPA. Um, and uh, what they were looking at was whether plasma exchange would reduce the risk of ESRD and death. Um, and it didn't. Um, and they also looked at whether reduced doses of glucocorticoids uh, would affect uh, the rates of ESRD or death, um, and they didn't. Um, and they also were associated with lower infection rates. Um, so important, important to basically not be doing plasma exchange and to be using lower doses of steroids. Um, this is a study of this drug, an oral C5A inhibitor, of Avacapan, um, in inducing and sustaining remission in GPA. And in a phase two study, it was shown to be effective in replacing high-dose glucocorticoids. And on the basic science side, a macrophage migration inhibiting factor was identified as a potential target for selective pharmacotherapy in GPA. For eGPA, Church Strauss, um, this was a study that was published in the New England Journal of mepolizumab, an anti-IL-5 drug versus placebo, plus standard care, um, for relapsing refractory eGPA. And what it found was that the patients who received mepolizumab um, had more weeks in remission, a higher uh, proportion of patients in remission, lower relapse rate, lower steroid doses overall. So this is the first FDA-approved drug for eGPA. So ANCA-associated vasculitis is, is the most active area of research in the vasculitis community right now. 
Um, and there's really a shift. What you're seeing is a shift away from broader and more significant immunosuppression towards more targeted agents. And in, in a sense that an improved understanding of the biology of these diseases will lead to additional targets. So that um, leads me to another study that we're involved with, which is um, called CUTIS, Clinical Transcriptomics and Systemic Vasculitis. And what we're doing here, it's a multi-center study, again, a partnership between rheumatology and dermatology. And we're getting skin biopsies of skin lesions in any type of vasculitis. If systemic vasculitis, they have a skin lesion, we're biopsying it. And we're doing detailed histologic analysis, but more importantly, looking at the gene expression uh, in those samples. And what we're trying to do is trying to understand, are there inflammatory pathways that are upregulated uh, in these diseases that we can then potentially identify as therapeutic targets? So, so far we've enrolled almost 50 patients in that study. So I'm gonna circle back to the case that we started with. This was that 55-year-old man with treated hepatitis C. He developed joint pains in retiform purpura and eschar on the lower extremities. And then, as I showed you before, a foot drop and a wrist drop, which of course is mononeuritis multiplex, a manifestation of medium vessel vasculitis, small to medium vessel vasculitis. So what do we do? Well, our biopsy of the skin shows clot and vasculitis involving small dermal vessels, review of systems notable for joint pains and weight loss, his urinalysis and creatinine are normal at this point, but when you dig through the outside hospital records, he actually had fairly significant proteinuria at the outside hospital before he was put on some prednisone. You may be thinking, hey, there's a patient with hepatitis C and he's got purpura and he's got wrist drop, foot drop. This is going to be cryovasculitis. And that's what we had told the medicine team, the primary team. But then his cryos come back negative and his hep C viral load is undetectable. And that kind of threw him for a loop. But his rheumatoid factor is greater than 600 and his complement levels are low. So, so what's going on here? Well, it's, don't fear, it's still cryovasculitis, and we'll kind of unpack what's going on with the labs. Because of the severity of his neurological deficits, he gets pulse steroids and rituximab. So what are cryos? Well, they're cold, precipitable, circulating immunoglobulins, and they can cause either a vasculopathy due to vascular occlusion or a vasculitis with vascular inflammation. So we break them up as types 1, 2, and 3. And type 1 is the sort of monoclonal gammopathy-associated uh, vasculopathy, really basically from just plugging up vessels. Whereas type two and three are so-called mixed cryos. And what's happening here is that you have um, antibodies, IgM antibodies, that are binding to the FC portion of IgG. And so when you send, we call that rheumatoid factor activity. When you send to RF, you are measuring the presence of antibodies that bind to other antibodies. And so for that reason, the rheumatoid factor is the poor man's cryo test. And so if you look in a textbook, it'll say that more than 70% of these patients will have a positive RF. And in an Italian study with over 200 patients, it was almost 100% of patients had a positive RF. And not just positive, but like very positive. Meanwhile, cryoglobulins are often falsely negative. So this is a test that you have to draw during a flare, um, get it straight to the lab. And it might be the third, fourth, fifth attempt that finally shows it positive. Complement levels usually low. And we're interested, of course, in hepatitis C, uh, HIV, Hep B, SPEP as tr potential triggers for this disease. So what's actually happening is that an underlying infectious or autoimmune process is causing B-cell stimulation and expansion. In fact, these patients have a high risk, higher risk of lymphoma down the line as well. Hepatitis C is by far the most common cause of cryovasculitis. Um, but as we talk about this patient who had treated hepatitis C, actually a full year before he presented here, you might ask, well, what happened there? We hope certainly that people who have hep C-associated cryovasculitis will have resolution of their cryovasculitis when we treat their hep C. But for some people, that B cell stimulation expansion persists, and that's essentially what happened here. Those cryo antibody complexes deposited in the skin and other organs uh, activate complement and cause damage. And what we see is skin, joint, nerve involvement um, with a pattern of small and medium vessel type lesions. So small vessel type lesion, palpable purpura, but also medium vessel type stuff, livido, retiform purpura, ulceration. And this poor gentleman who had a lesser version of this was uh, treated with uh, some soaks to remove crust, room temperature soaks. When they removed the soaks, he had very, very extensive uh, lesions, both palpable purpura and retiform purpura in the same leg, illustrating the sort of small and medium vessel type manifestations for cryovasculitis. And then lastly, this kind of uh, cold-induced acrocyanosis of the earlobe. You see it in the, in the fingertips as well, um, which is characteristic. So what lab test is a good screening tool for cryovasculitis? It's the RF. It's positive in almost all patients with cryovasculitis, and it's usually not just positive, but highly positive. So in summary, um, skin findings in vasculitis have diagnostic 
and potentially prognostic importance. We want to use the physical exam and our clinical acumen to our advantage, so there's a lot we can tell from the exam. But we do always want to confirm vasculitis with a biopsy, and ClinPath correlation is really important for this group of diseases. We don't want to overorder labs in straightforward cases of small vessel vasculitis, but rather let the review systems and exam guide what we're doing. Of the tests we can order as part of that initial workup, the UA with micro is probably the most important. We want to monitor the UA and blood pressure periodically while the patient has active rash, especially and frequently in IgA vasculitis. While we don't want to order randomly, we do want to learn how to use selected tests to our advantage as well. So low complement levels signifying a worse prognosis for urticarial vasculitis, as we mentioned. The rheumatoid factor as the poor man's cryo test. Remembering that ANCA tests are useful, but only one piece of the diagnostic puzzle. So if everything else is screaming GPA and they have a negative ANCA, doesn't make it not GPA. We want to evaluate for systemic disease in PAN with a CT angiogram. Remember those uh, renal aneurysms, aneurysmal dilations and narrowing. The CT appearance, CT angi angiographic appearance of that is virtually pathognomonic. Disease severity must guide management, so don't overuse prednisone in minimally symptomatic cases of skin-limited vasculitis. Efforts to identify the best drugs for these um, patients is ongoing. Um, and the trend in systemic vasculitis overall is toward more targeted therapies, reduced immunosuppression, less steroids, wherever possible. So I think, uh, no question, vasculitis can be difficult, confusing, but if you're systematic with your clinical and diagnostic approach, uh, I think we can be successful uh, with how we diagnose and manage these patients. Um, so, I thank you for your attention. I'm happy to answer any questions. Well, I mean, I think all of us, um, you know, no matter what your practice pattern, the most common thing that we're probably going to see is this garden variety, skin limited, small vessel vasculitis, cutaneous small vessel vasculitis. Um, certainly, epidemiologically, for in adults, IJ vasculitis is about a third as common as the cutaneous small vessel vasculitis. And then things like GPA, GPA, you know, these are several per million. Um, you know, but if you're at a, an academic center and you have a, a, a large catchment, you know, like, we have, like you have here, you're going to be seeing these patients. And I think, um, you know, I've been fooled plenty of times by, you know, things like eGPA presenting as hives. And, you know, so you have to have a low, uh, uh, a low threshold for thinking about these diseases. It's really uh, the ultimate sort of clinical uh, conundrum sometimes. Well, I like, the, I like having a syphilis question. That's a, <laughs> you always have to think about syphilis, right? I, I don't think syphilis comes up in our vasculitis differential much because it doesn't usually cause purpura. I mean, I suppose it's possible to kind of bleed into, you know, we see that phenomenon of bleeding into a rash where the patient's had a rash long enough or it's on the lower legs and they sort of have some, perp some red blood cell extravasation into these areas. So it's possible that you could see some kind of purpuric element perhaps, but usually I wouldn't have syphilis on this differential. But Syphilis, more broadly, I mean, as you probably know, it's uh, something that is uh, very present in our in our communities, and I think there's something like 50. I don't know if I don't know if this county is one of them, but there are 50 counties that, you know, account for uh, you know the majority of the new syphilis cases. Philadelphia being one, and uh, I actually uh, volunteer in an STD clinic once a month, and uh, we've seen it a couple of times uh, recently. So it's one of those things, if you don't think about it, you miss it. So it's never wrong to think about it, but I don't usually have it in this different. So for cutaneous PAN, I think it's challenging, right? Because basically, you know, I think if it's skin-limited disease that's not so terribly symptomatic, we try to get away with colchicine, dapsone, azathioprine. If there's ulceration, pain, and patients, by the way, also can have some paresthesias and things, mainly not because it's systemic, but because those deep dermal lesions are kind of ticking off cutaneous nerves. So they can be pretty symptomatic. Methotrexate, prednisone. Beyond that, 
you're basically borrowing from the systemic PAN literature, and that itself is such a rare disease that's poorly studied that basically it's like, I don't know, cetoxin, and, and that's basically the answer that you get. Um, I haven't personally used rituximab for se severe cutaneous PAN. Um, you know, would it make sense? Um, probably. There's some evidence that immune complexes are important for, P for PAN. So, um, you know, I think it's not a, it's certainly less toxic than some of your other options. Um, and, but you can find, you know, individual reports of just about any of these different therapies. It's, it's just hard to know what to make of them. Thank you very much. Thank you so much.